Let's take a look at the schematics for our clock. We can start with the power supply, which is represented by this symbol here. This will provide both high voltage for driving the tubes and also 5 volts for driving the Raspberry Pi and the low voltage electronics. The Nixie tubes are represented by these symbols. Each digit is connected to its own dedicated uh, cathode pin. And power is supplied through a common anode through a resistor. And when a cathode is pulled to ground, current will flow through the tube and the corresponding digit will start to glow. The purpose of this resistor is to limit the current through the tube when one of the cathodes is pulled down. And this is necessary since the IN12 tubes typically are rated for 2.5 milliamps of current. And the cathodes are connected to the driver outputs of a K155 ID1 BCD to decimal decoder. Uh, and BCD or binary code decimal enables us to represent the 0 through 9 digits using only 4 bits. The inputs are labeled ABCD and the outputs are labeled 0 through 9. And we can find the mapping from the 4 bit representation at the input to the decoded output by taking a quick look at the datasheet. And each of the input pins on these are connected to the output pin of a 74HC595 shift register. And since uh, this chip has 8 outputs, we can use one register to drive two tubes. Since we need to drive 6 tubes in total, we are going to need more than one shift register. Unfortunately, these registers can be daisy chained, so a chain of these can operate as one logical register. And by driving the serial data pins and the serial clock pin on these, we can transfer a series of bits into the register. And after all the bits have been clocked in, we then pulse the register clock pin or latch pin to make the register values appear at the output. And the K155 ID1 chip is a 5 volt device, which means that I'm also running the shift registers at 5 volts. But uh, since the Raspberry Pi is a 3.3 volt device, I should ideally use a voltage level translator between the Raspberry and the 5 volt logic. So I didn't have any in my inventory at the time, but I had loads of the ULN 2003 transistor array lying around. So I bolted on one of these uh, between the Pi and the 5 volt electronics as a level translation device. It works, but it will invert the logic going through. So I suggest you maybe don't copy this part of the schematic and instead use something like the TXP0104 translator instead. So moving on, uh, the next uh, symbol is the pinout for the Raspberry Pi 0 GPIO connector. And as we can see, the only pins that we're using are the GPIO 17, 22 and 27 pins. The rest is either power or ground or left unconnected. And that's it. That's an Ixi clock. And next, we'll take a look at some code for how you can program this clock. Before you can start programming the Pi, it has to be connected to a Wi-Fi network. And this is done by configuring the SSID, pre-shared key, etc. in our VPA supplicant file. We will also have to enable SSH, and the Pi will by default announce its presence on the network via MDNS. So, let's ping raspberrypi.local to see if we can find it, and then we can open a shell on it via SSH. And then, we can start coding. As you can see, I've cheated a bit and already written the code for driving the clock. Uh, the code consists of 42 lines of C code, and the only external dependency is to the 595 driver in the wiring Pi library. I also mentioned that I had hacked together an inverting level translation circuit, and this means that I had to apply a small patch to the 595 driver, and this basically just boiled down to inverting the high load logic in the driver code before recompiling it. So, let's go through the code and explain how it works. The digit array is a register of the BCD encodings that we will need to input to the K155 ID1 driver. 
to make it pull down the corresponding cathode pin for a digit at a given index. I define this as a two-dimensional array for readability, but we can also index this as a one-dimensional array, uh, and it will then provide us with the 4-bit representation for 0 at index 0, and the 4-bit representation of 1 at index 4, etc. The shift register output array is a representation of the output state that we want from our daisy chain shift registers. We have 24 pins in total, and this is basically just a sequence of 4-bit PCD representations that we want to input to our K155 ID1 Nixie drivers. The map time to buffer function takes a base 10 number uh, as input and maps this to the corresponding encoding that we need to represent that number via the output of the daisy chain shift registers. It basically just divides the input number by 10 in a loop and then extracts the individual digits before looking up the BCD encoding in the digit array and then transfers this to the correct index in the shift register output array. In the main function, we start by just initializing the wiring pi library. We then initialize the 595 driver in this library. The first argument is the base GPIO pin number that we want to index the shift register output pins from. The second argument is the number of output pins in total, and since we have three shift registers with eight outputs each, this argument is 24. The next arguments are the pin numbers that the 595 driver will use for the serial data pin, serial clock pin, and register clock or latch pin. The code then just goes into an infinite loop, and inside this loop I use the local time function to get the time of day. I then uh, convert the time of day to a decimal number by multiplying the hours with 10,000, the minutes by 100, and then adding the results together with the second count before calling the map time to buffer function. Uh, and this function then prepares the shift register output array with the correct PCD representation of each digit in this number. And then we just write out the contents of the array using the virtual GPIO index provided by the 595 driver. And that's it! Mix the clock firmware in 42 lines of C code. It may not be perfect code, but maybe it works. Let's compile it and see if we can get the Nixie tubes to light up. Okay, we built the Nixie clock. Uh, maybe it's time to try out something a bit more interesting. Let's modify the code and see if we can get it to display the number of YouTube views for one of my videos. And we're back to our shell. Uh, I decided to try to make the clock show a live count of the total views of one of my other YouTube videos, specifically uh, the Raspberry Pi Sumo robot video. And the correct way of doing this is, of course, to use the YouTube API. Or we can hack something together using a script instead, in order to extract the number of views from the web page. And first, we use uh, Curve to download the HTML for the web page. Uh, the view count should be in there somewhere. And second, we then remove any non-printing characters in the downloaded file and write the text only result to a new file. And lastly, we use grep uh, and a simple regex to find the element we are looking for, and then pipe the output to grep once again to extract the number. And we then write this to the total views txt file. So let's run the script and check the output. The number of views uh, should be somewhere around 1,000, I guess. I now have a working script that retrieves the view count of my video and stores this as a number in a text file. All I have to do now is to add a function to my existing code, which reads this number from the file and returns it as an integer value. I'll then use the return value as an argument to the map time to buffer function. So let's compile it and see if it works.
Okay, thanks for watching. See you next time.